For American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. The president is checking in with other heads of state as the coronavirus pandemic rages on. Fox's John Decker has more from the White House. The White House confirming that President Trump spoke today with Russian President Vladimir Putin to discuss the latest developments and efforts to combat the coronavirus pandemic. The two leaders agreed to work closely together through the G20 to drive the international campaign to defeat the virus and reinvigorate the global economy. For a country spanning two continents ravaged by the pandemic, Russia has a relatively low number of confirmed cases, a little over 1,800. The number of new cases per day in Russia has been steadily increasing. Field medical offices and hospitals are popping up throughout the U.S., Here's Fox's Jessica Rosenthal. FEMA has been organizing the building of multiple field medical facilities across the country with help from the Army Corps of Engineers and National Guard members in different states. In California, one of the field medical centers is at the Los Angeles Convention Center, where Eric Garcetti is the mayor. The field hospital will take the direction from the county um, of whether initially they had indicated it would be non-COVID patients. Now they're saying maybe it would be a place for COVID patients with uh, less uh, symptoms or lower symptoms. Field hospitals and medical centers are being built really all over, including in Detroit, Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, and New York's Javits Center. The American Civil Liberties Union and Planned Parenthood have filed lawsuits in Iowa and Ohio over access to abortions during the coronavirus crisis. Fox's Jeff Manasso. Planned Parenthood and the ACLU are asking courts to overturn orders in Iowa and Ohio that temporarily halt not essential or elective surgeries and procedures, including abortions, during the coronavirus pandemic and directives that also close businesses and tell people to stay home. Planned Parenthood, which is also suing Texas for a similar directive, calls abortions essential procedures. Though in a statement, Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds' office says the decision was was made to help strategically use the state's stockpile of personal protective gear. The Mississippi Senate has passed a bill to extend the state's Education Savings Account, or ESA, program, but an organization rooting for the bill says there are some seriously needed changes to make it acceptable. Bob Kellogg reports. Senate Bill 2594 would extend the life of the program for special needs students. But Grant Callen of Empower Mississippi says the original version contained hurdles that would have been difficult, if not impossible, to overcome. Most of the worst provisions in this bill were taken out. But I will say it's still got some really troubling components. But but it's a tricky situation because we need this bill to renew the program. The bill is now being taken up by the House. Callen says a lot of people would like to use the opportunity to close the program entirely or gut it so that it could serve only a few students. We are working with House members to see if we can make some additional improvements to this bill that would keep from hurting families but keep the option for families to participate in this great school choice program. If the legislature fails to pass a bill to extend the ESA program, it will end on June 30th of this year. I'm Bob Kellogg. The national average for a gallon of regular gasoline is pennies away from being $1.99 a gallon. Drivers were paying an average of two forty four this time last month, two sixty nine at this time last year. In final news this hour, a wildly popular quiz app is coming back to life. Here's Fox's Kristen Goodwin. HQ Trivia making a surprise return, reportedly thanks to an anonymous investor. The live game show app, which abruptly shut down and laid off its entire staff after an investment deal fell through, is back with a new show dubbed Chapter 2. Fans receiving a push notification letting them know many rejoicing online saying the reboot comes at a perfect time when many folks are stuck at home. Games will include a donation toward coronavirus-related efforts. Find more news at onenewsnow.com. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Claudio Rosano. Tune into my show, The Claudio Rosano Show, where I will be interviewing sports legends of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as well as talking sports with some old friends. You can hear us on claudiorelsano.com. That's C L A U D I O. R E I L S O N O dot com. And now at 4 p.m. on Fridays and 9 a.m. on Mondays at the George Espen Lobb Show on Facebook.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Total Media Network's Dr. Christopher Hall Show. And I'm excited to welcome the program, Dr. Christopher Hall. Dr. Hall, how are you? Uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's, I can't believe how fast March has flown by. I can't believe next week it'll be April. It's crazy to think about this. We're getting closer to summer. You know what? You're totally right. I mean, it seems that uh, uh, time is moving rather quickly. So, um, and, and it's awesome the the guests that we're having, and and and, and um, hopefully that will cheer everyone up. So, I'm excited about our guest today. Yes, and it hopefully will cheer us up. And that's the big thing is uh, the, during this time to have things that are positive, and that's what we try to do on the Dr. Christopher Hall Show and all of the Total Media Network shows is provide great content that's not griping about truly what's happening in the news. We don't need to. Let's have fun and hear a great story. So, Dr. Hall, introduce our guest. Well, no problem. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce a, um actor, a musician, um, and one of the stars of the Netflix family reunion, Mr. Cameron J. Wright. Welcome to the show, Cameron. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So, Cameron, how are you spending your days? Because uh, it's got to be different for you to be uh, quarantined, right? Oh, yes. It's kind of like a change of pace to having to stay inside, not getting to go anywhere. Uh, I'm doing my schoolwork because I'm homeschooled. So I'm just here doing school, working on music and stuff like that and just wishing I could be out on set. But I know it's better just to be inside and just to take things slowly right now. Take things slowly, take things the way we can do it. And Dr. Hall, what's really interesting, and I know you have a question for him, is that he's homeschooled. Well, my kids are being forced to homeschool because our school is sending work to them. So it depends on the school district in the country. Uh, we are going through the homeschooling route, Cameron, and you're going to find out more and more people online are being homeschooled yes. by the public education system. Depending on the school, it's not, It's let's say a state has a mandate, they, no one goes to school, which is most schools do. Not every one of them are online, Cameron. So I guess you're lucky that you're being homeschooled, that you don't have to be forced into something that a system that has not been really fixed yet for public education yes. to go online. Yes. And I feel like now the whole world is like experiencing homeschool like 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 I do. So it's pretty interesting, actually. All right. Go ahead, Dr. Hall, with your first question for Cameron. Well, no problem. Well, Cameron. Tell us a little bit about um, kind of like where, where you're from or you know, where you're living now and um, how did you get into um, acting? Oh, so I'm originally from a small city called Upland, and I moved out here to this area to, um, to Burbank to, so I could be on set for a family reunion. And I've, I started out with music, actually, and I started out with the piano, and I was – I wanted to sing actually, so because I had seen someone that plays the piano and sings, so it made me want to sing too. So I started with piano singing and just all the music stuff, and it eventually just started just to grow and just lead into acting. So then I started getting involved into the acting world, and then I just kept working and working and working until I finally got family reunion. It was like one of the best days of my life. Wow. So was that uh, was that a challenge when you first like first audition for things to see what kind of role you would get and kind of pay your dues in certain ways before family reunion? Oh, yes. You, you just you hear a lot of no's and you just it's like a lot of hard work. You just keep going and keep going and keep going because I've actually been acting for about four to five years. So and then family reunion is like the first major acting role that I've booked. So it's just keep keeping on going and just the right op opportunity will open up for you. And that's what we do talk about in the show, right, Dr. Hall, is going, dealing through adversity, regardless of the adversity, and to keep on going and not give up, right, Dr. Hall? No doubt. I mean, and, and that's very important. And, and that's kind of, you know, what, what Cameron is telling us, that, I mean, he's multi-talented. Um, he is, um, he's been in a number of movies. I know Tall Girl is one of them. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that's one of the main things. That, and he's putting that message out to our young people, the hard work and stay focused. Definitely, definitely. Where do you get that work ethic from, Cameron? To stay work. Um, yeah, you, just from yeah. just from family support mainly because my family has always supported me since I first started. They they've been involved with whatever I wanted to do, so it really helps having the family support, and it really helps me just never give up. Never give up. That's our great saying here on the Doctor Christopher Hall show. Go ahead, oh, yes. go ahead, Doctor Hall. Next question. Well, no problem. 
So, you know, Cameron, uh, on Family Reunion, you're working with a lot of um, uh, veteran actor, actresses and actors. I know Tia, Tia Mari is on there, and I think Loretta Devine. And so tell us a little bit about what you've learned from, from those actors. Oh, they've taught us kids so much about different acting tips. And Miss Tia, she was she told me that she was my age when she first started like acting and stuff like that. And it's really cool to get to be on the show with them and have them like kind of helping us and mentoring us. Like if we they show us like different techniques on how to like really dive into our characters and it really helps us a lot. So that's really great. Awesome. Awesome. And, that, and that's the the great thing is that mentorship to feel confident like when you're saying lines and different things to make sure you're on point, especially with the experience that some of the people in your cast have. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. And it's a, the, the thought process. Now, when you auditioned for Family Reunion, did you have an idea of what the, sh the, like the, the premise of the show or did you go in cold just auditioning for a specific part? Well, we kind of just got like the little outline, just like a family thing moves to Columbus, Georgia, and just like the first scene they gave us was this, this crazy church scene, and we had to, um, when we did the audition, and that scene actually, it wasn't in the show, but it was just like for like an audition scene, and it really, I really loved the show just from reading the first, like, just like the script, the scene that they sent for the audition, it, I could tell that it was just a, a, a hilarious show, so getting to book this show was just, it was amazing. Go ahead, Dr. Hall, with your next question. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, it's so great when we see um, uh, young people, uh, Cameron's age, who are, are doing so much. You know, they're involved with the acting and, and singing and um, and then, you know, just, just staying focused in school. So that's just so interesting. Well, Cameron, um, tell us a little bit about um, you start off in music. And um, so you're still you're still doing music now, right? I mean, I think your, yes. your YouTube channel, aren't you? There's a number of your your videos there where you're singing some some, some awesome songs there. Oh yes, I do have uh, my YouTube channel where I do some cover songs on there. And from those songs, right. what what is your goal in music? Um, my goal is just to um, be able to release some music that everyone like loves and people could sing along, and just. Probably like every musician's goal is just to have people like their songs and stuff like that. Great, great answer. Okay, Dr. Hall, next question. It's awesome. Well, you know what? Is there like a favorite kind of uh, inspirational song that, that you can think of, Cameron, that you like? Uh, I I love and I sing every kind of music. I love mainly R&B and like soul, like the Motown. I love Motown. <laughs> That's great. How did you get uh, get into Motown? Who uh, introduced you to Motown? Wait, what was that? I said, who introduced you to Motown? Oh, my whole family, we all love music. We're a very musical family, and we all love listening to music. And my mom, she's, like, raised me on a lot of different music. She, I, she was always playing music, like, in the car rides. Every time she would be playing music, and it was, like, old school music so that I could grow up listening to that old school music so I was familiar with all that stuff. So it was really great. All right. Uh, now, Dr. Hall, that's an interesting thing is when we talk about passion, and it seems like he's doing things he's passionate about for sure, Dr. Hall. I mean, no doubt, certainly. And I think the important thing is that how he talks about um, these influences of his mother. And so, Cameron, tell us a little bit about that. How um, has she inspired you to, to, to be successful in this sort of acting and music? Tell us about how your mom has influenced you. Oh, yes. My mom has been there for, like, everything. She's helped me. She's took me everywhere I needed to go. And she she even left work so that I could be part of Family Reunion, which really means a lot to me that she's just giving her time so that I'm able to be able to do what I love to do. And awesome. what, what are, what are your goals in acting? What do you want to do now? You're on family reunion, but I'm sure you're auditioning for other roles as well. Not before the coronavirus hit, but meaning when there was auditions and stuff, what, what do you ultimately want to do with TV film, everything? I'd say everything, just any, any opportunity that opens up, I, it's just perfect. Like, family reunion has just been, like, the greatest blessing in the entire world. So just really anything, everything, just I'm really grateful for everything. 
Okay, Dr. Hall, next question. Oh, sure, no problem. And so, now suppose that you, um, um, you know, uh, you know, you suppose that you uh, did not go into, say, acting or into music, and it was a wonderful field. You're obviously been very successful. Did you have any other interests besides, say, music, say, acting? Just, just wondering. Uh, well, if, <laughs> if I didn't do music and acting, probably some kind of tech design. I really like tech like technology designing but i'd say like music and acting those are like really just like those are in my heart so i don't think anything would ever be able to take me away from those interesting and what about for school you're homeschooled right now uh yes are you going to go to college after you graduate from high school oh yes yes hopefully yes what do you want to major in then <laughs> oh that's a good question um I'm probably going to start ha having to think about that as of like next year, but I'm not really sure right now. You got to think about that. And as the education person oh, yeah. that I am, figure it out. If you like tech stuff, I would definitely do something that, you know, that you can still act and have another side hustle if you need to. And that's in the technology oh, yeah. field. We can work any hours. And you could work remotely. So you could be at auditions and then at night take care of a lot of the different things. Either have your own business or work specific hours based on your your expertise level and more and more remote going. I would go the tech route if I were you. Awesome. Thank you for the advice. Okay, Dr. Hall, next question. Wow, incredible. I'm, I'm just so impressed with this young man. He's such a great example of, of what we like to see in, in young people in America. So, well, Cameron, let me ask you this. So what do you think about this? See if you, I don't know, see if you can finish this phrase if I say this. So now that I have you in my arms, I want you back. Yes, I do now. I want you back. Ooh, ooh, baby. I want you back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want you back. Nah, 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 nah. Oh my! Awesome. Okay, so that was a great question. Now you see, you see, Doctor Hall. I was like, okay, where am I going with this one? Okay, I got it. Uh, so now I I could talk about the musicians that have sung on my show. Uh, it's a you have to go back in my history of, of interviews of celebrities, Cameron. If you go back, you'll see some of them that have sung. The Wiggles is one of them. I, it's funny. I, I don't remember always uh, the the late Lynn Anderson uh, uh, sung on. Um, had uh, sung on my show. Um, it just depends on who I've just asked to sing. It's so you were definitely sound great. And, uh, and what do you think through your experience as an actor? Uh, do you think that's going to lead to more music opportunities, opening up doors, especially with roles where you have to sing as well? Oh yes, just definitely roles have been opened up like okay so nick cannon he reached out to me through my instagram so i'm a part of a group called a band called mtk right now and we've recorded um a few songs and they're hopefully going to be coming out soon this year and we've been working on a youtube channel and everything so i'd say like roles have been opened up because of like the show and singing and everything and just it's just it's all blessing it's just yeah <laughs> so you use that Instagram. So did Nick know of you because of family reunion or just through your Instagram? Uh, I'm not sure actually, but it just whatever happened it was a blessing. So <laughs> exactly. What do you think? Have you gotten the chance to talk to Nick after that and have a conversation after he reached out to you via Instagram? Oh yes, he's he's the founder of the band NTK. Oh really? So oh. He, when we're whenever we're in like the studio and stuff, he's always there. Whenever we're, we're recording YouTube videos, he's always there, and he's very involved in the project, which is awesome. So Dr. Hall, there's a chance, you know, even though he's big in Family Reunion, uh, having Nick Cannon being involved in this, uh, Dr. Hall could mean he might be a bigger music star than actor. So that's going to be interesting, Dr. Hall, to see. Well, you know, it, it, this is this is what what kind of we've seen over the years. You know, when we have these talented young people like Cameron, and they, you know, display their talent to the world, and, and you know, they're in the right place. I mean, there it's just it's a prescription for success. I mean, so this is this is very exciting. I'm very excited for Cameron. Oh, thank you very much. So, how are you keeping busy, like with media? Are you doing more media now, Cameron, because you're home and not have you know you have still homeschooling, but are you more flexible now because you're not doing events and stuff? And oh yes, I'm just 
I'm probably available anytime anyone needs because I'm just here, just see, kicking see, back. See, that's the only that's the only plus side we're dealing with right now is you know sometimes yeah. it, our our schedules don't fit each other and i'm like okay let me reach out to specific somebody and this and that but it's just great and, and i'm glad for yes. you and i'm excited for you and uh and with all the success and what goals do you have do you have uh you talked about you know music and all that stuff but do you have like any big goals for yourself that you've set for music and also for acting um probably I mean, for acting, I feel like I have reached my goal, which my goal was to book a TV show. So being on Family Reunion has just been amazing. And I guess my goal is just to hopefully just have people like what I'm doing and have people just just like my acting, like my music and everything. And my goal is just to get to a point where I'm able to give back to the community and give back to everyone that's like maybe not as fortunate and doesn't have everything they need to really build like a successful career so like hopefully with, with music i'd be be able to like open something up where i could give like instruments and just help help kids that want that this is their passion but they don't really have enough to be able to start it so just to give people like a kickstart so you want to give back especially when people like nick cannon give you an opportunity people like family reunion gives you an opportunity yes. the bigger and bigger the star you become the more you want to give back. And I love that because again, we all at one point in time were in a lower position, you know, we yes. were just, we're starting out. Um, and I look at that all the time in any of the industries I'm in. And I don't look at people and say, well, you know what? That, I'm not going to give them a time of day. It cracks me up when I hear people say, well, I won't go on this show because of a certain size of it, or I won't go do this because it's not as big. Well, you never know where those people are going to end up someday. And that's, exactly. the, that's where we have to look at things. And it's all about our passion and getting our, getting our message out. So Dr. Hall summarize Cameron. I know you're very impressed, Dr. Hall. And, uh, it, he's a really impressive guy. Oh, no doubt. And, and so we have it, um, a very inspirational young man out of Burbank, California, who again has, um, with just his presence on the show, I'm sure has lightened up America, uh, a lot in this, this very uh, difficult epidemic we're doing now with this uh, COVID-19 virus. So, and his future is promising. Okay. He's a hard worker. He's very intelligent. And, um, and so we really appreciate you coming on the show today, Cameron. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Cameron, where can we follow you and stuff? And especially when we're going to follow your music, because I'm sure, like you said, right now, Nick and you guys are in the studios getting things together yes. before this is going to blow up at one point in time with Nick. I have a feeling. <laughs> Everyone can follow me on Instagram at the Cameron J Wright. All right, all right. Well, I appreciate you coming by. Best of luck. Thank you and, so much uh, for having me. And I hope again you, we end this coronavirus and we all could be back yes. doing the things we need to do. But we're dealing with it. I call it week two of quarantine, uh, week two yes. of school because Pennsylvania took a little longer to <laughs> have that be under house advisement, and you guys are. I think it was fifteen days. So. Let's see if we survive, and then we're not sitting down oh, yes. three, three weeks from now saying, Neil, I want to talk to you again because I'm stuck in my house, and I need to talk to somebody. And that's what we're running into, but I appreciate it. A very, very articulate and very, very great interview, and great job, man, young man. Thank you appreciate so much. It. Thank you. Thank appreciate, you, Cameron. Appreciate coming on. Thank All you. Right. Take care, guys. All right. That was All the, right. That was, Thank you. You're welcome. That was the Dr. Christopher Hall Show, everyone. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Total Media Network's Dr. Christopher Hall Show. Uh, Dr. Hall, how are you? And uh, excited to chat with you today. And you've been talking Corona on a lot of podcasts, and you're ready to talk uh, some more inspiring things after going through that, right? It's just you've been hit up with this, and you're challenged in your emergency room. It's been a lot of interesting things, hasn't it, the last couple of weeks? No doubt, no doubt. It's... Uh... You know, it's still a very, it's just sort of a volatile situation, and um, so it's very exciting to to have a very exciting guest today. And I'm very uh, happy to uh, get started talking about him, talk and to talk to him. Yeah, and I, I love mysteries, and I love crime, and I, I'm not, I don't want to commit crimes. However, I love that kind of thing, and he's a journalist as well, and he, it's gonna be a very interesting conversation. So go ahead and introduce our guest. Well, no problem. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce a veteran journalist, an author, uh, award-winning book author um, of the um, a, a very popular mystery series, series, 
Um, yeah. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Michael S. Daigle. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. It's uh, wonderful to have a chance to talk to you. So, Michael, how are you holding up? I always ask every guest. I've asked so many celebrities in the last couple of weeks how you're holding up with the coronavirus. I, those stories, this will all go in the history books because it will never disappear, this interview, 20, 30 years down the line. So the question is, how did you? How are you dealing with the coronavirus? Um, I've been working from home for the last decade, so this isn't much of a change for me. Um I leave the house to walk the dog lately. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't, we don't, it's just my wife and I at the house. So, you know, we don't need to run to the grocery store every day. Uh, we go about once a week. Um, so it hasn't been disruptive yet. Um, unfortunately, nobody in my family uh, has contracted the, the disease and we're all seem to be healthy and, so far, so good, and I hope that's the well, way that's, it is with uh, you and most of your listeners. That's that's great, and that's we we wish all our listeners the best help if they do have the virus, or if not, just to enjoy what we try to provide every day, five days a week here on the Total Media Network, and also all the syndicated channels all over the world. Uh, the great content wherever you're pulling it in from. So go ahead, Doctor Hall, with your question. Well, no problem. I mean, I'm always excited when we get an author on the show. Um, they're such dynamic individuals. So, so Michael, tell us a little bit about um, just kind of where you're from and how you ended up um, in, um, in journalism. I, um, I have lived in the Northeast uh, U.S. All, all my life, uh, various states. My family is from both uh, Louisiana, Texas on my father's side and New England on my mother's side. We were Navy brats. So uh, when my father, my father was in the Navy for 20 odd years and we moved all over the place and then um, we settled around Boston and I've lived in Massachusetts and Maine and New York and uh, New Jersey. Um, I got into, I uh, went to college in New York state, um, uh, started writing books. Then I wrote a couple of, uh, uh, gee, look at this kind of books when I was 23, 24 uh, without having any idea how to write anything, by the way, uh, you just sit down and do it. Uh, but then I got into, after being in the restaurant business and other businesses for a while, I walked into a, a small newsroom at the request of a friend of mine in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. And I knew that's where I belonged. And so I stayed in the newspaper business for the next 35 years. Um, uh, you can't if if you're a writer and you have that opportunity. We were we were working in startup businesses and small weekly newspapers and midsize uh, daily newspapers, and it's the best job in the world. Um, and you can't get over it. Uh, you just do it every day and you work with great people and have the opportunity to meet lots of great people and you use all of that experience um, to turn around fiction that you write from it. So. <clears throat> most famous person you interviewed or covered uh one of the most famous people i interviewed was tommy james of the shondells uh i inter i've interviewed numerous congressmen uh governors of new jersey um tommy james in fact his drummer i was working in morristown new jersey his for original drummer was from morristown um, he lives in New Jersey now, and he'd come over to do a benefit um, uh, for his uh, charity. Uh, and the drummer's mother and sisters and all those folks showed up at the interview at Town Hall, and we had a great time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fun interviewing. Um, he's a real down-to-earth guy, worked really hard in his business, you know, and, and he, like all, <clears throat> like many of the um, – uh, rock and rollers are astounded 40 years later, he's still doing it, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, part of my job is, uh, cover, covering environment and government and all of that was interviewing, you know, people in a high elected office. Um, so there's a long list of folks. It's always interesting to be a journalist. And I look back at my days of, uh, the people I've interviewed and what I've learned. It's just amazing. All right, Dr. Hall, next question for Mike. No problem, no problem. Well, you know, it's been my experience that a lot of authors and journalists sometimes, you know, uh, 
what they write about are sometimes um, sometimes things that influence their life. And um, I know this particular series, and I think this current book, the um, is it the Red Hand? Is that correct? Yeah, the Red Hand is the latest one. Yes, exactly. And so I know that's one of the books in this 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 mystery series that mm-hmm. involves this detective. I believe it's Frank Nagler. Correct. So um, tell us a little bit about. Um, I guess I would just say, tell us a little bit about Morristown. Um, Morristown um, is the county seat in Morris County, New Jersey. Uh, it's an old, old town. Goes, It was settled long before the American Revolution. Um, I worked there and in Dover, New Jersey, which was another old town uh, settled uh, settled in the early 1700s. Um, Today, Morris Morris County is the fifth or sixth richest place in the world. Um, it is a, a university town, a corporate headquarter town, and is one of those thriving New Jersey old suburbs that invents itself and and thrives. Ironton, New Jersey, in the in the Frank Nagler books, is a is a town that people recognize if you lived in the United States in the last fifty years. Uh, industry failed after World War II. It takes a long time to recover. Uh, people moved out. New people moved in. And what you have sometimes, you have a town, towns that struggle to get economically back on the ground. Uh, it's a recognizable trend, especially in the Northeast, the Midwest. Uh, uh, any town that had heavy industry after World War II went through that phase. Morristown itself was lucky that it recovered more quickly than the town of Dover. Dover was the iron manufacturing center and is the model for Ironton. Uh, it was an, uh, in the uh, 1800s, it was called the Pittsburgh of New Jersey. Um, a fabulous iron mining and manufacturing business that generated millions and millions in wealth that's still in effect, that the industry has gone, but the money's still there today so that that's so interesting so i'm familiar with Morristown, morristown new jersey because my sister-in-law's husband uh was a, at dental school and uh and then did an internship in morristown so they okay. know that story of morristown and the the wealth and the but i remember always driving by morristown to drive to new york city to the national publicity summit when i've attended as a member of the media about seven mm-hmm. times, three or four times and i do the whole drive from from uh, Pittsburgh to all the way to New York City and passing Morristown. So yes, it's a sure. it's a definite area. But what's really weird about Morristown, uh, Chris, is the fact that around it there's not there's some very poorer towns around it, right? That's the yeah. That that's straight. That that's an interesting place where you have such wealth and then just drive a couple miles down the road and you're in a different environment. Yeah, in the starting, <clears throat> excuse me, starting in the seventies. When suburbia took over uh, North Jersey, um, uh, towns like towns like Dover struggled. Uh, they did not have like the actual landscape to attract um, uh, lots of new residents. It's a very small town, um, and historically, it, it's interesting because up until probably the '60s. Um, the two power centers in Morris County were Morristown, where the money was, and Dover was where all the factories were. Uh, over time, Dover became uh, a, a, a sort of a poor town because the factories disappeared. Um, and it took a long time for them uh, to get going again. They have lots of, and I use this, the buildings as a setting in the novels, um, <clears throat> they have lots of infrastructure, but they didn't have anybody want to come in because it was in pretty bad shape. It took big investment by numerous uh, people uh, and companies to get some of these factories back into operation as something else. Um, but it's a fa- it's it's the story of many 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 towns and cities uh, in our country. Uh, your industry goes away, your jobs go away. Suburbia takes your people away, and you have to figure out how to survive. And that's part of the story of Ironton. That's part of the story of Frank Nagler in all the books, and especially in The Red Hand, because it's the 
the one that puts all of that in place. All right, Dr. Hall, next question. Wonderful. And exactly. So that's kind of what um, kind of what we're getting at is this um, town Ironton that we see in this mystery. Mm-hmm. And again, you said, you know, it's kind of like, again, uh, the fact that uh, industries uh, go away and it's very descriptive in the novels. And therefore, we see that what can occur in this case is, is we can have, uh, say, politicians who can come in and, and take advantage of the situation. And then we have uh, crime that, that arises. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit, a little more about Iron Town and and um, I guess about uh, Frank Nagler, the central character. Um, Frank, I, I wrote the first novel in this series back when I was like 23 or 24. It was actually what became the second book in the series, a game called Dead. Um, <clears throat> but Frank, uh, Frank is a re- – and when I moved to New Jersey and, and um, began working on the so- – I moved the story to, uh, to Ironton – because I had done research on the old iron industry and I saw here was a place I could anchor this story. So Frank uh, is the son of a factory worker and an iron miner. Uh, His grandfather worked in the mines. He grew up in what I call the workers ghetto. Um, And it's a separate place where, you know, the workers live in bad houses and try to survive. And it's part of the trend, uh, the long story arc in these books of setting the haves against the have-nots. And Frank is a have-not, and that drives his police work because he thinks the people of the town deserve better. Um, And when he runs into crooked politicians, for example, and in the first book, first published book in the series, the old mayor is a crook, and at the end of the book, Frank basically yells at him for being a crook, (laughs) you know, while he's being arrested. He said, you know, you're the problem here. You you had an opportunity to take care of this town and you took care of yourself. Um, And I think it's a, it's a real story that people recognize. And Frank in the first book, uh, the swamps of Jersey is described essentially as the the last honest man. Uh, He opens it with a Noah joke. Um, he's driving down through flooded streets and he asks himself, you know, what would the ancients do with a, with a rainstorm like this? And he kind of laughs and goes, well, they'd craft a story about a guy in a boat and talk about the wages of sin. Um, then they'd get out of town. <clears throat> and Frank is that last honest man. He's the one who stands up and he's told in all of the books and especially in the red hand, that you have to do this, Frank, because nobody else is standing up for us. And he takes it on himself, and it becomes his character. He's he's middle-aged, uh, uh, not in the red hand. In the red hand, he's a rookie cop, and but it's forming him. Um, he's he's um, moody. He's he's pretty lonely because his wife dies when she was young. And I can I can say that because it's not a secret because she died uh-huh. in the first in the first book he talks right. about her being dead and and that was the problem with writing the Red Hand is I had basically had to write it as if I didn't know that she was going to die. Um, the hardest thing to do as an author is to write a book where you actually know everything that's going to happen. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> you know? Without um, spoiling. So, it. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know because you, I'm, I'm sitting there telling the characters. <clears throat> what to do, when to say it, when to do it. And I, it was, I was, it took me six months to figure it out. And I, I ran into a guy <clears throat> at Philadelphia at a book show. He was a music producer and we were talking, his wife was selling books there. And I took a break and he asked me what I was working on. I said, you know, I'm having a problem with this, this story. I can't, I know it. Uh, I know it too well. And he said, you know, my guys come into the studio with a with a hot new sheet of music and they can't play it so i take the sheet away put them in a a practice room for half an hour and then bring them back out and they can play it he said your problem is you're overthinking it and you're trying to tell your characters what to do just write the story and i thought about that on the way home and he was right and that's exactly what i was doing Um, i wasn't writing the story i was sort of dictating the story um, and that's the worst thing you can do because it was 
it was awful. <laughs> you know? no, no, so look, I had look, definitely thinking about uh, Frank versus you. How much <clears throat> yeah. is he you? Very little, very little. I thought of Frank Nagel when I was 23 years old. I knew nothing about police work and I knew nothing about writing a book. He's mostly, he's a made up character. Um, I understand his, um, I understand him being an outsider because that, and that comes from moving around a lot as a kid. I was always the new kid in school. Um, but Frank refines that as, um, as somewhat of the outsider and the, the, um, the issues with his wife, um, make him very much of a loner, but it also gives him, a, a, an edge, a moody edge that helps his police work. And he, he's grief stricken, uh, for all of these books. And that's something that I have to fix in the next one <laughs> because five books of grief, stri- of grief strife is a little too much. Uh, but he's, he's pure imagination. Uh, I, I, you know, when I got out of college, I didn't know any cops unless they'd stop me from pulling me over to give me a ticket. Um, I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't know how to write anything about police work, but I sat down and said, I bet I can write a police mystery. And I did. Um, <laughs> took a while to get it right. You know, it took, a, it took a while to get it yeah. right, but eventually it got better, you know? All right. Next question, Dr. Hall. Well, no problem. And it, it appears that, you know, again, Frank Nagler is this heroic figure. He's had some, um, like you said, some pains in life, but, you know, the death of his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, he ends up in a situation where um, he, um, I mean, all the weight is on him, okay? Yeah. And um, who can he turn to? And so what I was wondering was, are there any real characters in life that you see, uh, even throughout history, um, that um, Frank would uh, be very similar to? Um, the, the, yeah, I th- there, there are a lot of characters who are thrust into um, important and leadership roles in their life simply because they happen to show up at the right moment. Um, the part of the background on this story actually is uh, John Updike's rabbit series, the Harry Angstrom, uh, books. Um, he, he carries around a lot of guilt and angst in his whole life. And what I thought of when I was writing, um, Frank Nagler and Ironton is I use that model, um, for the relationship between Frank and the town, uh, the ups and downs that, that take place in Ironton, uh, is also reflected in Frank's character. Um, you know, it, um, subconsciously, did I borrow from somebody's story that I had read? Probably. I mean, there are a lot of heroic people who show up at the right time. Um, and as I got better at writing these books, that's how I moved Frank in the direction. In The Red Hand, you see the formation of that character. He's a rookie cop. He walks into a, uh, a murder scene and he said, you know, I haven't even taken the cover off my book yet. And here I am writing, uh, having to, uh, investigate a murder that the, uh, um, medical examiner calls an experiment in death. And he goes, what am I doing here? You know, and the book is about his growth to accept that mantle that's handed to him as the one person who can actually, work through all of that um, and find, solve the crimes. So, Wow. It's when you talk about just that without giving things away, what kind of mysteries do we expect in this kind of thing? Do you have any certain stories that you saw that you wanted to parallel in the book based on something um, that happened in the news that you covered? Well, in, in the, in the third book in the series, uh, it was called The Weight of Living. Uh, it is based on uh, a story that we worked on when I worked at the uh, Morning Sentinel in uh, Waterville, Maine in the 80s. Um, the short version is that police were investigating or announced they were investigating a child sex ring, which in Maine at that time was kind of rare, uh, especially in big rural communities like where where we were working. 
it turned out that that might not have been the case. We started working on it, um, and the uh, there was something fishy going on. We got calls from an investigator in that case who suggested that there was something wrong with the whole investigation. And while we were working on it, it got shut down. Uh, and in, in that story, uh, and what the one line that I remember from that, which is really why I wrote the book is this investigator said that, um, what it actually turned out to be was, um, a multi-generation, uh, case of incest. Um, and the, uh, investigator, the one line the investigator said that stuck with me all these years was one of the young victims in that ring was taken to a psychiatric hospital in Pennsylvania where they reconstructed her personality. Um, oh, wow. I, I, I gave, I, I, I was talking to, um, an old family friend who's a psychologist and he said, you know, strictly speaking, that's not true. You can't do that. And I said, yeah, I understand that. I said, but you know, as a, as a fiction writer, what a place to jump off into a story. Um, but most of these other, most of the other crime, I mean, in, in, um, in the red hand, the, the, the main criminal is Charlie Adams. He's a, he's a kid, um, serial killer. Um, uh, he, the two things happen in the town. He goes around killing lots of people and they can't catch him. But the story is also about the terror that that killing spree raises in the town. There's lots of, there's lots of crowd scenes and lots of people running around beating up people who they think is the bad guy. And there's, um, you know, street riots and all sorts of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but you know, and he's, you know, I didn't do any psychological studies of, of uh, serial killers, but there's plenty of general information out there. And what I wanted to do with him was just really strip him down to sort of a, a basic character without deviling deeply into whatever his uh, sincere problems were. He showed up in the first version of A Game Called Dead. Uh, and in a Game Called Dead, he was just a miserable, um, loner, um, who became somehow attached to this girl at a college, uh, and then becomes, uh, obsessed with getting revenge against Nagler's friend, Leonard, who's a blind man who runs a bookstore. Cause at 24, that made perfect sense. Um, and so Charlie becomes he he is the antithesis to Frank Nagler. They're both outsiders. They're both from the have not side of town. And in the red hand, uh, Martha, uh, Frank's wife, because Frank goes, you know, I know this guy. He's me. And, and Martha says, no, he's not you. You got out of that. You did not become a serial killer. You became a cop. You became somebody everyone looks up to. Um, but, and he kind of said, yeah, but I, you know, I wonder about that sometimes. And that's part of his dilemma is, is, is growing up in the workers ghetto, something that uh, is like a shadow that he's never going to be able to escape. And it lives with him all the time. So. Okay. Chris, another question for Mike, Michael. Oh, sure. No problem. And so, and, and, and so anyway, Ironton, um, is you know obviously a, a, a fictional city, uh, mm -hmm. but really, I mean, when you work as a reporter, um, you're really reporting on, on real things. You know, uh, yeah. you're trying to bring out a story, um, or you're trying to bring a, highlight uh, something that's going on. So now, now, let me ask you this, Michael. Um, now, when you were working in uh, places like around uh, Dover, Morristown, in New Jersey, um. Did you actually see from the political establishment and from, say, the crime establishment that these things were occurring? Um, yeah, these are fictionalized versions of stuff that I knew was going on. Uh, I covered uh, – the thing that you do at a, at a medium-sized paper is you cover all aspects of whatever shows up in the towns or the counties that you're covering. Um, I covered – uh, trials where, you know, there were, there were killers. Um, 
I, I, I knew enough about uh, uh, real estate development and I saw some really shady deals. Uh, and I saw a couple of many instances where uh, I think in one of the books, I make a reference to passing a redevelopment plan that would only benefit your brother-in-law. Um, I saw that kind of stuff happening all the time um, because the smaller you are, the less you, you get, you write it just inside the law and you can get away with it. And that, I saw that happen. And that's sort of the basis of the long, uh, long running crime scheme here is that people are always using government positions to put themselves in, in the position through a straw company or something where they could buy um, a piece of property and then sell it to themselves and then sell it to somebody else and then sell it to somebody else. It's all paperwork. And as one of the, uh, one of the scumbag lawyers in this thing said, you know, the thing about real estate law uh, and the real estate papers is that they, they sit you down, they give you a hundred pages to sign, tell you where to put your initials and you never read the document, you know, and that's pretty much true. Oh, and yeah, incredible. Okay. Back I, I, mean, I bought a couple of houses and that's what happens. They sit down, yeah. they give you 50 pages of a contract and they tell you where to initial it, you know, Exactly. And, so, that, and sometimes not that time to review that for sure. All right, Dr. Hall, summarize Michael. No problem. No problem. And and so we have a, a, um, very a veteran, um, uh, journalist author, uh, award winning, a mystery series. That's no, um, definitely of the series and all that. Everyone can check out by Googling him. I appreciate another great Dr. Christopher Hall show. Take care everyone. See you guys. All right. Bye-bye. You're listening to the, that was the Dr. Christopher Hall show, everyone. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Neil Haley Show's Freedom from Addiction segment. And I'm excited to welcome the program, Reverend Wynn Henderson. Wynn, how are you? Uh, you know, it just seems like Groundhog Day in, in so many ways. And today's topic is going to be an update to the coronavirus and where we're at, uh, yourself, how you are just hanging in there and how our lives have changed in so many ways. Absolutely. The whole world is turned upside down in less than a month, hasn't it? Um, so I'm sheltering in place. It means I'm only going out for groceries or something really important. And it gives me more time to think about what's happening and to be able to talk to you and other people. So that's, that's a positive. Oh, it it absolutely is a positive, and it's something that you know we um, we have to ch try to look at in, in so many ways, and look at how people are going to act differently, how different responses in our daily routine are going to be thrown off, uh, how people that we deal with on a regular basis are going to fly off the handle, to uh, just different. The, the way we interact as a society has changed in just a short period of time. I, th I think that if we were attacked by a military opponent, that there would be less confusion and fear than by this virus. So, you know, I mean, back in World War II, the country galvanized and people were at home and they were, doing all kinds of things to support the military. And in a way, it's, it's similar. It's an attack, but we don't have a, a known attacker in this particular case. No, we don't. We definitely don't have an, a known attacker. And the unknown and uncertainty, if you, and this is the point I'm going to make in this, and then I want to hear what your take is. I think this is more of a conversation for your podcast and my uh, National Syndicated Radio Show is the simple fact that, um, we hear different things. We hear our president talk about we're going to open up on Easter Sunday. Then five days later, he's talking about quarantining all of New York City and anywhere where it's a hot zone where no one can go in and out. So what process are we dealing with? We continue to have a different conversation. Uh, we have people like Bill Gates saying we need to uh, basically shut down this country for 12 to 16 weeks. The whole world should shut down for 12 to 16 weeks to somebody else that says business as usual. This virus is not that dangerous. 
like uh, uh, Vice President Pence. The problem I have is, you know, you talk to John Q. Public, we don't know when this is going to end. Uh, that's, that's true. We don't know when it's going to end. Everybody says it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that's about the major thing that I've gotten out of listening to the news. Well, how many cases do you have in your area? Well, I'm in a, a mountainous uh, area of western North Carolina, and our population of our town is 3,000. We don't have any, but we do have one in the lower part of the county. What about the state of North Carolina? Do you? I don't know if you have the numbers. Like, for example, Pennsylvania, I mean, Allegheny County out in, uh, has like 130 cases. I guess Pennsylvania has 1,000 plus. The concern I have is all the big cities are going to be flooded with coronavirus. And so rural areas like yourself are going to be more in a safe situation. But how do we keep from really maybe having now to self-quarantine more and have the right resources to get people once they know they have the virus, not infecting everyone after they get diagnosed? Yeah, that's a real problem. And as they get more testing kits out there so that everybody can get tested if they want to, we'll know what the true impact of the um, disease is. Absolutely. The true impact of the disease and all those different things. So what are your, what is your take from this? What should you tell your listeners and my listeners about the update on the coronavirus? Okay. Let me uh, start by going directly to the listeners. I want you to know that it's a pleasure to have you listening to my show today. My sincerest desire is for you to get something from it that will make your life richer and fuller. Now, I'm Reverend Wynn Henderson as an ordained Christian minister and a medical doctor. I have a dual perspective to bring you content to solve problems in your life. Freedom from Addiction and Share Your Mission is the longest running, single hosted and produced radio internet talk show in the country. It has been continuously running for the last 20 years. I introduce you to celebrities and non-celebrities alike who have something to say about the disease of addiction in any of its 30 plus different forms and about the importance of finding your mission or purpose in life and then acting on it. So today we're gonna give you a couple of updates about the coronavirus. And first, I would like uh, to tell you something about inflammation. Now, inflammation is a process the body uses to deal with infection or injury. The major problem with decreasing inflammation is that it inhibits the body from dealing effectively with infections like, in our discussion today, the coronavirus. Decreasing inflammation by use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAID, NSAIDs, lowers our defense response to the coronavirus. Now, researchers have linked inflammation to nearly every chronic disease of aging. Chronic inflammation is a slow creeping condition caused by misfiring of the immune system that keeps your body in a long-term state of high alert. When cells are in distress, they release chemicals that alert the immune system. And then white blood cells rush to the scene where they work to eat up bacteria, viruses, and damaged cells from infection or injury. It is often chronic inflammation and not the viruses themselves that cause much of the long-term damage. Obesity, unregulated stress, tobacco use, alcohol use, lack of physical activity, poor sleep, and poor diet are all linked to chronic inflammation. And the big four for treating chronic inflammation are Food, sleep, stress release, and exercise. 
the difference between someone feeling okay and feeling great is often the exercise. Now we'll get into a report that people are talking about that was on the internet recently. The French health minister put out a report saying ibuprofen might be harmful in the treatment of coronavirus, but this is theoretical. Nothing has yet been proven scientifically with a randomized double-blind study. The World Health Organization is not aware of scientific randomized double-blind studies dealing with the effect ibuprofen would have on the coronavirus. And some other health experts say that NSAIDs could weaken the immune system when taken in connection with an active infection. The coronavirus has been looked at as open studies, but not the scientifically based random double blind studies, which is the real answer to getting at the truth of a question. Now, what is an antidotal report? Now, this is a type of report which is not necessarily true or reliable because it is based on personal opinions rather than substantiated facts or the research I just talked about. An ICU nurse has posted on the internet an antidotal report that practically all our patients with coronavirus had ibuprofen in their system and concluded wow. her, opinion, her opinion that it made the disease 10 times worse. She said that ibuprofen kickstarts the virus into pneumonia. Now, this is not proven by valid scientific research at this point. Out of an abundance of caution, do not use ibuprofen, which is the world's most widely used non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, as a fever and pain-reducing drug in the case of coronavirus infections. Paracetamol, which is most commonly sold under the brand name Tylenol or generically under the name acetaminophen, should be used as a fever and pain reducing drug instead. I mean, and now, wow. Yeah, you know, what do you think about that? I mean, see, and that's the thing that if you can figure out certain things like this, then you're going to find out what happens with the virus. I think one thing we have to look at, the United States, the number of cases. Let's look at the number of deaths versus other countries uh, when and then let's have a talk. We all want to push, oh, we have more cases, almost more cases than Italy or all those places. Well, we have more population, first of all. And second of all, what about deaths? And so let's look at the most important thing. How many people are dying? And if we could decrease the people who die, that should be the numbers that we should look at in the next two to three months. So with that story about ibuprofen, even though it's not scientifically based on a study, it still is something to keep in your mind about if you've got an alternative drug that doesn't have this report and is not an NSAID, why not use it? It only makes sense. Exactly. It's a great point. It's a great topic, and it was perfect for the Neil Haley Show's Freedom from Addiction segment. People could check you out at RevWinHendersonMD.com. There, they can check out all the different resources you have available and all your social media channels. They can check you out as well, and uh, it's great resource involving ibuprofen. So your recommendation, don't take it. If you have a fever or something, take Tylenol until this crisis is over. Now, Neil, I've got one other thing I want to tell you. Sure. I got a postcard from the government, um, and it came in yesterday. If things change so quickly, uh, it was printed March 16th. But it says President Trump's coronavirus guidelines for America. And I want to tell you what those guidelines are, since you may have been getting them bits and 
Hello, everyone. This is Claudio Rosano. Tune into my show, The Claudio Rosano Show, where I will be interviewing sports legends of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as well as talking sports with some old friends. You can hear us on ClaudioRosano.com. That's C L A U D I O R E I L S O N O.com. And now at 4 p.m. on Fridays and 9 a.m. on Mondays at The George Espen Lobb Show on Facebook. The swinging sixties. The swinging sixties. The swinging sixties. The swinging sixties show with Harry Burke on, on Springer.com. Hey, this is Harry over here in Ireland. Welcome you to the swinging sixties show. Sunday evenings, twenty hundred hours GMT. I will play Beatles, Kinks, Beach Boys, Carpenters, Elvery Brothers, lots of classic oldies. We have quizzes. We have all things going on here. So Google the swinging sixties show. Be heard. Come into the chat room. 